welcome and uh, uh, thanks to uh, all those who have uh, logged in and are participating in this session today. Uh, we know that uh, registrations were, were quite numerous and uh, we're grateful for the interest and the, the participation of all. Let me introduce the speakers uh, speaking to you right now. My name is Paul Lalonde. Uh, I'm a partner in the uh, Toronto office uh, of Denton's and I'm the uh, lead of uh, our national regulatory practice group. Uh, uh, with me today is uh, Sean Stevenson, counsel with Dentons here in Toronto as well. Uh, Sean's practice focuses on international trade, investment, arbitration, and related ESG matters. And he's particularly focused on the S and G components of ESG with particular expertise on the incorporation of ESG and human rights considerations in international uh, supply chains. Um, Andrea Bossi uh, is our third panelist. Uh, welcome, Andrea. Uh, Andrea is Associate General Counsel Compliance Programs at Enbridge, where she has been for the last five years. Uh, prior to and Enbridge, uh, Andrea held a number of positions in both ethics and compliance and commercial and legal roles at a number of companies in the energy pipelines and chemicals and petrochemicals industries in Calgary, including Alliance Pap Pipeline, TransCanada Pipeline, now TC Energy, and Nova Chemicals. Andrea's practice is now uh, focused largely on third-party risk, as well as uh, anti-bribery and anti-corruption, sanctions, competition law, inter-affiliate codes of conduct, and human rights. So ESG and supply chain matters are at the very heart of what she does every day, and we're very lucky and we're very grateful that Andrea is accepted to be uh, uh, on our panel today. Um, so what are we going to co uh, cover today? If you can move to the next si slide, Lindsay. Um, uh, I'm going to start uh, us off today with a few general observations about the evolution of supply chain ESG uh, uh, considerations. Uh, Sean is then going to discuss specific trade-related risks in international supply chains and particularly recent legislative developments uh, of interest. And finally, we're gonna delve into some more detailed topics in an interview style format with Andrea, uh, who'll focus on uh, energy, uh, Enbridge's uh, supply chain ESG uh, journey so far. Um, in terms of uh, the evolution of ESG, look, ESG consideration seem unbelievably topical these days. It's very difficult to open your inbox without getting something ESG related, it seems these days. But these considerations aren't new. Uh, certainly what we see today, you can trace their origins easily back to the 80s and 90s when we saw the emergence and the development of, of concepts like corporate so social responsibility, sustainable development, and triple bottom line. I provide in the slide there a number of milestones that uh, that occurred during the 2000s and into the into the, the 2010s. Uh, more recently, in the 2020s, uh, we've seen a pretty sharp acceleration of uh, initiatives, standards, and guidance on ESG. Uh, that, that includes things like uh, the Institutional Shareholder Service Group of Companies uh, publishing ESG scores, the launch of S&P's ESG indices, uh, the World Economic Forum Sustainable Value Creation Metrics, uh, and Canadian Securities Administrators and International Sustainability Standards Board Climate Disclosure Standards, among uh, many other uh, developments. You can move to the next slide. With respect to supply chain ESG specifically, um, this uh, uh, refers uh, to integrating uh, environmental and socially respon responsible procurement practices in the complete life, life cycle of a product or project. Uh, a manufacturer or a, a large project proponent's ESG footprint is often more in its supply chain than it's in its direct operations or in the actual building of a piece of infrastructure. Uh, this means that programs and solutions tied 
to uh, uh, the supply chains can yield major ESG gains. Uh, at the same time, conversely, failing to mind supply chain ESG risks can lead to major problems uh, and, and legal and reputational risks. Uh, uh, those risks uh, the, 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 uh, and associated regulatory burdens uh, related to ESG, and particularly the S and G components of ESG, in our view, are growing and are becoming more acute. And uh, uh, it, it behooves uh, in-house counsel, in particular, to be aware of these evolving and growing uh, risks. Um, if you can move to the next slide, uh, just to underscore the significance of uh, the, the uh, ESG uh, uh, component in supply chains, uh, in a recent US, UN Global Compact publication under the auspices of the uh, Principles for Responsible Investment, uh, the share of different sectors' environmental impact that's located in the supply chain was assessed. And as you can see from the slide, uh, the dark blue part of the chart is the supply chain's component of the overall environmental impact by sector. Uh, so I've, I've circled, uh, drawn a red circle around the oil and gas sector, not to particularly pick on that sector, but since we have a guest from that sector, it made sense. The proportion is estimated at at 44 to 64% of overall environmental impact being in the supply chain as opposed to direct operations. So all that to say that getting a handle on ESG in a comp company's supply chain can yield uh, very substantial dividends in terms of achieving the company's ESGs, ESG goals. And so uh, on that basis, we think that uh, the topic today is uh, is particularly um, particularly relevant. So I'll hand it off now to Sean to talk about developments in the S and G components of ESG, and notably the emergence of modern slavery reporting legislation in Canada, following on similar developments uh, in other countries. So Sean, off to you. Um, thanks, Paul. Uh, if we just go to the, the next slide. Hey, Lindsay. Um, so over the past few years, we have seen a sort of multiplication of uh, legislative requirements uh, or different requirements in relation to uh, supply chains, particularly focused on uh, modern slavery components. Um, we first saw this in the, uh, uh, the, the Kuzma agreement or USMCA, where in the labor chapter, a prohibition on uh, goods made in whole or in part by forced labor. Um, so what that essentially means is Canada has a prohibition on any good made in whole or in part uh, by forced or child labor. So to the extent you have a good uh, where it has been determined that that is in fact uh, the case, uh, that good is prohibited from entering into Canada. Um, the customs and trade prohibitions have been you know, particularly noticeable uh, in our neighbors uh, down south, um, and particularly through the, the Uyghur Forced Labor uh, Prevention Act, which creates a presumption that certain goods are made from, uh, from forced labor. Uh, Canada doesn't have similar legislation creating the presumption. However, the, the custom tariff uh, does have a fairly low threshold. Um, to the extent that uh, Canadian Customs, uh, the CBSA, has a reasonable indication that goods are made in a whole or in part by forced labor. Uh, the burden then shifts. Goods. So similar, um, a similar investigative process that is required by Canadian Customs law. Um, that we have in Canada. 
That being said, the, the significant difference we see between you know, the United States and Canada on the customs prohibition is in enforcement. Uh, in the United States, uh, it is well documented that there have been uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of goods that have been stopped, uh, many of which were subsequently released, but at least stopped for investigation. Uh, in Canada, to date, uh, in terms of public knowledge, we only have a few. Um, so in addition to the customs prohibition, uh, Canada has implemented a few other measures. Um, they've uh, sanctioned uh, uh, China, um, particularly there's been a, a list-based sanction. So there are currently four individuals and one entity that have been sanctioned. So that, that is the broad, uh, broad-based prohibition that is included in most Canadian sanctions as a dealing ban. So you cannot deal uh, in the property of uh, those listed individuals. Uh, and similarly, Canada has in included an amendment to its uh, procurement code of conduct. So um, to the extent that you are selling goods to the government, those goods obviously can't be, uh, have been made in whole or in part by forced labor. And to the extent there is, um, you can have um, fairly significant consequences in relation to your ability to sell to the government of Canada uh, in the future. Um, now, most recently, and, and what most of us have probably heard of, and, and what Paul noted, uh, was Canada has adopted a, a new piece of legislation called the Fighting Against Forced Labor and Child Labor in Supply Chains Act, uh, and that is essentially Canada's modern slavery legislation. So uh, this act was passed in Parliament on May 3rd of this year, so it is relatively new. Uh, it enters into force on January 1st of 2024. Uh, and requires that certain entities provide reports about their supply chain and what they're doing to uh, to reduce and minimize forced and child labor in their supply chain. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about uh, that particular act as it's top of mind for many people. Um, first of all, uh, who needs to report uh, or who is caught by the act? Um, you know, I would note that the act applies to certain government institutions as well as a broad swath of uh, of private uh, private entities, but for the private entities that need to report, um, you have to look at the definition of the entity. So that's step one. Um, so it's a broad, generally speaking, definition of who's uh, who's included. So you can be a corporation, trust, partnership, essentially any form of business organization. Um, if you are listed on a Canadian stock exchange, you uh, you are included within the definition of that entity. Uh, and if you are not listed, but uh, you meet two out of the three criteria that you can see there, so you have twenty million dollars in assets, you've been uh, you've generated at least forty million dollars of revenue, or you employ an average of two hundred and fifty uh, people. So if you meet two out of those three criteria, uh, you're then also considered an entity uh, based on the definition of uh, of entity in the Act, and can potentially be uh, subject to reporting. Now, there is a second part of the analysis that you need to do uh, to ensure that you do need to report. Um, so you need to, uh, to meet that second criteria, you need to produce, sell, or distribute goods in Canada or anywhere else. So to the extent that you are dealing in goods, you, are, uh, you need to be re uh, reporting. Um, you, if you import goods uh, produced outside of Canada, you can also, if you meet that definition of entity, also need to be reporting. And also if you control goods. Um, so if you meet the definition of an entity and you, uh, or sorry, you control an entity that uh, does either uh, distribute, sell, or produce goods in Canada or imports goods, um, you also uh, then need to be reporting. So it can include certain parent corporations to the extent that they meet the, the definition of an entity, even though that, the parent corporation itself might not be selling uh, goods themselves. They might just be a, a, a hold co. Um, now, what, uh, what do these reports need to cover? We can just go to the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, so there are seven criteria that are mandated uh, in the legislation that need to be covered by the reports. Um, and what the criteria effectively do is they assume that companies have gone through a risk mapping process. Um, now, it's not a requirement to have gone through the, a risk mapping process, but you know, based on the criteria that are that's in the legislation, uh, there is an 
effectively an underlying assumption that companies know their own risks and are taking steps uh, to uh, to mitigate the risks of forced labor and child labor. Um, so what you need to set out is you know your structure, your business structure, activities, supply chain, uh, your policies and due diligence that you put in place in relation to forced labor and child labor, um, and particularly you know where the risks are. Uh, so that's really what they want to be looking at. Um, in addition to the extent you've found any forced or child labor in supply chains, you're, they want to be looking at remedial measures. Um, and, um, you know, particularly, I would note um, uh, the criteria E there that you have on this on the screen. Um, loss of income to the most vulnerable families um, where, where you have found forced labor. Um, so that is sort of a... Uh, broad criteria that says, to the extent you find forced labor or child labor in your supply chains, we don't want you to just cut and run from that. Uh, we want you to actually help uh, the, the companies, the, the individuals that, uh, that are in those positions to get out of that situation. And we've seen cases like that as well, where you know, companies have found forced labor in their supply chains. And instead of simply just you know, removing that supplier, uh, they've taken positive actions to try and help that supplier uh, uh, sort of remedy the situation and um, uh, put those uh, folks in a better position. Um, so that's generally speaking what needs to be included within the report. Um, you know, you can look at training measures as well, uh, category F, uh, and then of course uh, monitoring uh, and sort of uh, how do you know your measures are being effective. Um, you know, that's the category G there. So we a generally comprehensive report is, is what is wanted in this legislation. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, many companies are sort of looking at this and struggling with, you know, what do they need to implement? Um, generally speaking, all of this is a risk-based assessment. So, you know, when we talk about supply chain mapping and where are your risks, um, you know, the reports can be in certain instances probably fairly short if a company has a relatively low risk profile. Um, and to the extent a company has, you know, has a supply chain that goes into potential uh, geographic areas that are uh, known to have forced or child labor uh, or particular industries where that is uh, prevalent, um, you know, maybe a more robust uh, response is, uh, is required. Um, if we could just go to the next slide, I'll also want to highlight just a few key aspects. So other than the reports themselves, um, you know, why does this matter to people? Uh, or to businesses, um, you know, first off, these reports are public. Um, so pursuant to the act, uh, if you are a reporting entity, the reports must be placed on a prominent uh, position in uh, on the on a, on a company's website. Uh, they also will be included in a public government registry online. So, you know, the reports themselves will be public. Uh, for uh, companies that are constituted under the Canada Business Corporations Act or other acts of the uh, Canadian Parliament, so you know, federally incorporated. Um, you do need to send these reports out to your shareholders along with other financial reporting documents. Um, the reports themselves must be approved by an entity's board and signed off by directors. Uh, and interestingly enough, this act includes a specific liability for directors and officers. So any violation of the act itself, uh, you know, a, a claim can be brought by the government um, towards the company itself, but also to the specific directors and officers that would have knowledge of the uh, of the potential violation. Um, speaking of, of uh, the violations, what are they? Um, you would uh, violate the act if you are a reporting entity and, you know, for example, don't submit your report to the minister uh, or don't submit that report on, um, uh, on your website. Uh, you would also have a potential violation if any of the claims made in the report uh, are found to be false or misleading. Uh, so that is something that I think companies are really gonna want to, uh, going to watch out for to, to the extent that you have something in your, your report, you really want to ensure that you know, those are the policies that are you know, one in place and, and two, uh, the policies that are being followed as well. Um, because, you know, not only could you have a company liability there, but, you know, potentially also you're looking at uh, a director and officer uh, liability. Um, so what can be done? You know, what, what are some of the measures that uh, the companies can be looking for uh, to, to implement in terms of policies? Uh, if we could just go to the next slide. 
Um, you know, briefly, as I mentioned, risk mapping. So there are many tools out there, uh, third party providers, um, you know, law firms can assist with mapping out your risks and sort of developing your internal governance documents to take into consideration supply chains uh, and, uh, and human rights compliance risks. Um, you know, you obviously, I think, you know, the, the first step that you can do is start with knowing your suppliers. So getting, uh, uh, you know, know your client sort of, or know your supplier documents, questionnaires, there are uh, third party screening mechanisms that can be engaged. Um, you know, when you look at your relationship with suppliers, not only first tier, but second, third and fourth, uh, many contractual provisions that can be put on, uh, put into contracts um, you know, and, and the development of supplier codes of conduct that are supportive of these types of measures, uh, all the way through to sort of continuous monitoring and, and even audits in, uh, in certain cases. So I've generally set out a, um, a risk, a supplier risk overview on the next slide. So, you know, walking us through, you know, when we're looking at our, our different suppliers, uh, you know, what is the life cycle of, uh, of those types of contracts? And we start from obviously a business need and go on to different steps that can be taken from, you know, general questionnaires to third, you know, third party monitoring to more specific questionnaires before you engage into a contract. Uh, and then obviously monitoring compliance through the contract itself. Um, so this is generally speaking new for many companies in Canada. Um, you know, many companies are looking at to how to respond to this legislation right now. Um, I would say as a, as a general caution, I mean, risk mapping exercises and the development of these policies can be a, a heavy, heavy lift. Uh, and I think as we will we'll see from Andrea, um, uh, in, in our discussion that comes, um, you know, this, uh, to the extent you're you're looking at putting into to place sort of a best practice, um, you know, risk mapping uh, policy for your organization, uh, it can be a a, a time consuming effort. Uh, but once you're there and you're and uh, those things are in place, um, you know, you do have more certainty on one your suppliers and your supply chain, uh, but two that you'll you'll be able to one comply with these reports and that these reports can be made. In, not only best practice from a compliance uh, perspective in terms of reporting, uh, but also in relation to, to ESG, um, as that's something that uh, investors might be interested in as well. Um, so with that, I will stop here uh, on the, uh, the human rights uh, sort of developments that we've seen in Canada. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat um, and we'll hand it back off to Paul and, uh, and Andrea. Thanks, Sean. Um, well, actually, uh, that's a nice segue because there is a, Q, a question in the Q&A. And the question is, when you say located in the supply chain, do you mean upstream and downstream supply chain? I guess that uh, that refers back to the chart I had up about uh, the proportion of ESG impact or environmental impact located in the supply chain. In that context, what we mean by supply chain is um, uh, the the upstream part of the supply chain, in the sense of all the the purchase, the procurement of uh, goods, materials, components, parts that go into the production of the product that's then sold on to uh, a consumer or a customer. In, in the context of a project, of a major infrastructure project, it would be all of the goods uh, uh, purchased, the goods, materials, components, et cetera, purchased to incorporate into uh, the production of the infrastructure in question. So that's what we mean by, by supply chain. If you want a good definition, I like McKinsey's, which, uh, which says the supply chain is the interconnected journey that raw materials, components, and goods take before their assembly and sale to customers. So for our purposes, that's uh, that's not a bad definition. You do see sometimes supply chain uh, defined more broadly as encompassing everything from you know, the purchase of raw materials right up to the product landing at the door of the consumer. Um, uh, uh, that, that, that distribution side of the supply chain uh, that's that's not captured by the uh, the UN study I was I was referring to. Uh, there's another question. Um, 
Uh, is this directed at the importer of record, i.e. a distributor, or does it extend to their end clients, i.e. producers? I'm not sure uh, I understand that question or if it's if it refers to the requirements, uh, the reporting requirements that Sean was just talking about. Um, perhaps you can clarify the question or if it's clear to you, Sean, uh, you can uh, volunteer a, a, a response to that. So again, is, the, is this directed, I'm not sure what the this is, is this directed at the importer of record, i.e. a distributor? or does it, does it extend to their end clients, i.e. producers? Um, so the uh, customs prohibition would be uh, on Canadian importers. So to the extent that you are the importer of the good, you are the uh, the person that is responsible for that good uh, to, the, to the CBSA. So to the extent that there is a uh, determination that a good is made in whole or in part by forced labor, um, you know, you would be responsible to respond to the CBSA to to prove that it is in fact not um, to the extent that it's not, uh, then the good would be allowed to enter into Canada to the extent that it is determined to be and you don't have that, you know, sort of uh, tip to tail analysis on the good. Um, going down to the the raw material. There is another question in the uh, Q&A. How much responsibility do we have for contractors we engage? How much due diligence on their risk assessment do we need to do? Uh, um, to I, okay. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, 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 what I suggest is that we launch into uh, Andrea's part of the presentation, because uh, I think it's going to address some of the questions that we have uh, in the, in the Q&A right now. So, Andrea, again, welcome and thanks for agreeing to uh, to do this. Um, uh, first, let's start at a high level. Uh, can you explain why it's important for Enbridge to implement its uh, environmental, social, and government's objectives in its supply chain? Why why does this stuff matter to to your company? Yeah, well, uh, ESG is a, a really big focus actually for Enbridge, and it's something that our investors, lenders, and other stakeholders expect of us. So we're actually frequently asked by those parties how we're managing those issues, both within the company and in our supply chain. So um, within Enbridge, as part of the energy transition, we're investing heavily in self-solar power, for example, for our pipelines, as well as in renewables more generally. And Enbridge is also a signatory to the United Nations Global Compact and is committed to diversity and inclusion, sustainability, human rights, and responsible sourcing of goods and services. And to meet those commitments, we work closely with Indigenous communities, for example, um, and we actively support Indigenous companies as suppliers of goods and services. And we also have a zero tolerance approach to forced labor, child labor, and human trafficking in our supply chain, as well as the use of undue force in the security context for our projects. So those are things we actively work to ensure that aren't associated in any way with our projects or operations. And again, that's you know, both because it's the right thing to do and, and it is something that's expected by our stakeholders. All right, and can you, uh, can you summarize then, you talked about, you touched upon some of them, but what are the key ESG expectations and requirements that, uh, that Enbridge is that Enbridge imposes on on its suppliers. So if I'm a business, I'm doing selling goods and services to Enbridge, what can I expect in terms of your requirements on the ESG front? So we, we actually have a supplier code of conduct, which is publicly available on our, our external website. Um, and uh, in addition to general compliance with specific you know, legal and, and ethical principles, it does specifically address the supp supplier's sustainability and human rights. Um, so those include requirements regarding environmental stewardship, diversity and indigenous engagement, uh, as well as prohibiting human rights abuses. So things like Sean was talking about forced labor, child labor and human trafficking. Um, we also address these issues in other external facing policies, including our sustainability policy, our statement on business conduct, mm -hmm. our indigenous peoples policy and our supplier diversity policy. And, and is uh, are all these policies and codes and so on uh, uh, readily publicly available? Where do I find yes. them? 
Yes, if you actually, uh, on our external webpage, if you click on our sustainability, um, there's a tab at the top, I believe, that's uh, sustainability. If you click on that, all of those policies can be found there. All right, and can you describe to us generally your uh, your supplier intake process? So what what's uh, what am I what hoops am I going to have to go through if I want to sell to to Enbridge? Yeah, so um, first of all, um, and Enbridge's supply chain management team actually uses a company called Ecovadis or Ecovadis. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, and it specifically rates suppliers in terms of ESG performance generally. So there's a whole area there that that is not within um, my team's area. But we separately have within ethics and compliance a third party risk management program uh, whereby we also vet third parties that we do business with, uh, including our suppliers for ethics and compliance risk. So that includes things like sanctions, bribery and corruption, but also human rights violations. Um, and the way our program works is basically the internal person who wants to use a supplier uh, will complete a form that asks a few high level questions regarding the nature of the good or service being supplied, the location where it'll be supplied or produced, uh, the value of the contract, those sorts of things. And then the system, which has a built in algorithm, uh, assesses the supplier based on the responses to those questions as low, medium or high risk. So those suppliers that are considered medium or high risk are then asked to complete a questionnaire that asks more detailed questions, which we then review and assess to determine whether in rare situations, uh, we don't recommend doing business with them, or more commonly, we recommend putting in place mitigations, including contractual protections, and in some cases, training for key individuals involved in the supply contract. And then there's also ongoing monitoring and alerts if issues actually arise. Um, I should also note that in higher risk situations, we actually get our external due diligence provider to conduct a further level of due diligence since they have access to some databases that we don't necessarily have access to. Um, and with respect to products that carry with them particularly high risk, we actually have included in our request for quotes or request for proposals specific questions regarding those risk areas. So things like the sources of key materials and components. Uh, in some cases, we've requested particular assurances on specific areas of risk. Um, and we've asked proponents at the RFP stage to confirm they will agree to specific contractual language regarding those issues. And those responses are all taken into account in choosing the successful proponent in the RFP process. Okay. Um, and in your assessment of, uh, of suppliers, um, what about second and third tier suppliers and sub suppliers? Uh, do your requirements uh, flow down to them? How, how far does your vetting go? down into the supply chain of your suppliers. Yeah, yeah, and as, as you pointed out in your presentations, that's a really critical piece because it's the whole supply chain that matters. So, so our supplier code of conduct actually requires that our suppliers also require their suppliers involved in the Enbridge contracts to comply with our code. Um, we also, as part of our third-party risk management program, as I mentioned, um, uh, we ask our medium and high-risk suppliers to complete a questionnaire. And in that questionnaire, we ask the supplier to provide the names of their subcontractors and our suppliers that will be providing key materials or services as part of those contracts. And the questionnaire then also asks them whether they have a third party risk management program in place. And we also review that as part of our vetting process. Uh, and in particularly high risk situations, we have even had an external due diligence provider perform additional due diligence into the supplier's suppliers um, to the extent that information is available publicly. And uh, in some situations, we are actually looking right now at third party audits of the suppliers facilities to confirm where some of the products are coming from. Or I, products that inputs into their products. Just a, a, a follow up on that. Um, uh, I, I hear you say that to a certain degree, how far you're going to dig and do due diligence on the supply chain of your suppliers depends on uh, whether they're high risk or not. Can you give us a sense of, uh, of, of, of how you make that determination? Uh, yeah. How's that risk assessment work? Yeah, so, so 
Yeah, well, well, as I said, we've got some built-in al algorithms into our system, but also we are um, we have rated certain products as particularly high risk. Um, so, for example, uh, solar panels are um, the majority of the polysilicone that's produced in the world that um, is a key component of uh, solar panels is produced in China, much of it in the Xinjiang region, which is where the Uyghur population is being exposed to forced labor. So that is one, for example, we have flagged as particularly high risk. So, and of course, you know, it's this is where the E and the S of ESG conflict a little bit. So, so we're, um, you know, we we need to make sure that those suppliers are not are not uh, incorporating forced labor in any way into their products. So, so that's an example. You know, for so we look at because we're not just looking at these issues. We're human rights. We're also looking at bribery and corruption. We're looking at you know the location where they're located, where the products are being produced or supplied. Um, all of those sorts of things factor into our risk assessment process and the the algorithms that are applied. Okay, so I just want to pause there. There was a question in the Q and A that was, how much responsibility do we have for contractors we engage? And how much due diligence on, on their risk assessment do we need to do? And I think from, from the discussion we're having now, Andrea, uh, it, it, the answer to that question is, unfortunately, it depends. And it's very much driven by uh, the presence of risk drivers for the things you talked about, forced labor and so on. So in terms of how much responsibility do do uh, purchasers have for their contractor for the contractors they they engage? Um, if you're acting as the importer of a product, uh, you have a high degree of responsibility, and the goods could get seized if the CBSA comes to the conclusion that there's a reasonable indication that forced labor was involved in the production of those goods. So that I would say is a high degree of responsibility and a high degree of risk. If an important component gets stopped at the border, and that can have a you know very severe impact. The, the risk is high to your operations, to the smooth running of, of the business. And how much due diligence on their risk assessment do you do you do? Again, it depends. If you're talking about a Fortune 500 company with demonstrated uh, commitment to ESG, a member of the UN Global Compact operating in low risk jurisdictions, that tells you something about the amount of due diligence you're doing. If you're talking about a country that operates in a very high uh, corruption uh, environment uh, where there are reports of forced labor being used, that tells you something about the level of due diligence you may want to want to make. So I hope that helps answer the question uh, on, uh, on, on that front. Um, Going back to uh, the Enbridge experience, um, what happens when a supplier in your uh, uh, in your environment in your supply system fails to live up to the standards in your policy? So you get a report, or you come to the considered understanding that one of your suppliers hasn't lived up to the business code of conduct that that you ask them to live up to. Yeah. So so once of course we're at the stage, so, so all the things I described before were more sort of the pre, you know, the, the vetting as we're onboarding a supplier, but um, there's, a, as I said, there's ongoing monitoring. So there is the potential that we could find something later on once the contract is already underway. Um, so our supplier code of conduct, as I mentioned earlier, is actually attached to our supply contract. So it forms part of our contracts with our suppliers. And the contracts themselves provide for a right of termination in the event of non-compliance with that code. And depending on the nature of the contract, so for example, if it's a service contract, we might also have an individual removed from our site or project for failure to comply with one of our policies. Okay, so your, your contracts give you some contractual mechanisms that you can deploy if, uh, and it's your judgment then as to the severity of the breach and, and what, what you want to exercise. Yeah. Um, uh, as, a, as a related question, does your whistleblowing policy, a whistleblower program allow for second and third tier suppliers to, to come forward? Um, is your system equipped to, to get whistleblower reports from, from that level of, uh, of your supply chain? 
Yeah, um, actually, our ethics helpline is actually publicly available. Um, again, the number is right on our external web page. So any calls that are made to that line are taken very seriously and are investigated to the extent we're able to do so based on the information that's provided. Um, and if the complaint is substantiated, we do take action on it as well. So the nature of the action, again, you know, depends on what the violation is and the specific circumstances around it. Um, but but yes, I'm short answer is yes. Uh, anybody can make a call to the line, and um, and we do take those seriously. Okay. Um, and uh, this is a bit of a tough question. I hope not too sensitive, but what, what are the parts of your policies or requirements that give suppliers the most difficulty? Uh, where, if anywhere, do you, do you get pushback? Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's very nice, Enbridge, but, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we can't comply with this or we, we won't comply with this or we can't commit to this or that. Um, yeah. How do you handle that? Yeah, so actually, and frankly, it's kind of surprising to me, but most suppliers really don't have an issue with our supplier code of conduct. Um, and I think those that do, you know, we often just point out to them, these are standard requirements that you require with or that you comply with normal legal and ethical obligations. So they normally accept that. Um, there have been a few suppliers that will say, you know, they they comply with their own codes. Um, mm -hmm. So generally, we would we do respond and say that that's generally all right, as long as, you know, we have an opportunity to review their codes and ensure that they meet an equivalent or higher standard to ours. So as long as they're bound by by something that's that's a reasonable standard, you know, we will accept that. So uh, that, that's interesting. You can get into the, the battle of the codes of conduct and deciding yeah. which one is the, high, the higher standard. <laughs> Gonna yeah. Continue. Yes. Yes, that does happen. But I think I mean most of the companies that we deal with are, you know, fairly sophisticated and will have in place, you know, reasonable reasonable codes as well. So. Good. Thanks. Um, as a listed public company. Um, you'll need to send your reports to shareholders along with financial disclosure documentation uh, once we get the, uh, the the reports required under the legislation that uh, that Sean was describing. Uh, uh, have you already started communicating how you are taking, you know, in advance of this legislation coming up, are you already communicating to stakeholders how you're taking human rights into cons consideration? Uh, in your supply chain. Tell us a little bit about the reporting side uh, of all this and how that's uh, how that's experienced at, at Enbridge. Right, well, we, we do publish and make uh, available on our external webpage, um, both in you know, our policies, as I mentioned previously, but also our annual sustainability reports. And in those reports, we do report on the things we're doing, including our third-party risk program, et cetera. Um, we're actually also in the process right now of uh, developing a human rights web page. So there'll kind of be, although we've got human rights referenced in all these different policies, um, the intent of this web page will be to kind of bring it all together. Uh, and so it's one stop shopping on all the things we're doing with respect to human rights. Uh, and of course, like everyone else, we're, we're currently working on how to comply with the new modern slavery reporting requirements. So just had a meeting on that actually this week uh, where we've kind of set out all the requirements and, and what mitigations we've got in place in terms of all of them and how we will how we will respond to, to those, those things. So it's still early days, but we're working on that now. Good. Um, let me move now to uh, another one of the questions uh, that's come up in the Q&A. Um, to me, uh, the question is, if my company buys, say, a chemical from Walmart, hypothetical example of a distributor in Canada versus from the manufacturer overseas, so we would need to assess and, and report, question mark, or does Walmart do that and we rely on Walmart's reporting? I think that ties back into the discussion we had about the previous question uh, about the nature of the supplier and, and the risk analysis you do around the nature of the supplier and the good that you're getting and where the good typically comes from. 
So if you're talking about a rare earth uh, 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 metal from uh, a country that is uh, war torn and where there are uh, 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 reports of human rights abuses and uh, uh, violations of international humanitarian law, and Canada has sanctions, uh, and it's a very uh, perceived to be a very corrupt country, that's a different risk assessment than buying uh, a commodity from, um, you know, for example, Norway from a well-known Fortune 500 supplier. So it starts with an understanding of what the risk uh, profile is of, of that particular supply. And, and here you're you give an example of a company like like Walmart, obviously a you know the largest retailer in the world, perhaps other than Amazon. Um, uh, uh, and you're buying domestically here in Canada. That transaction has a has a very low risk profile for you. The goods aren't going to get intercepted at the border or or anything like that, assuming you're buying domestically. Again, if you're buying overseas from the producer, you want to know who you're dealing with and you want to have a good understanding of the risk profile of that producer and whether there might be some uh, supply interruptions uh, related to uh, the ESG risks associated with, with that producer or whether there's reputational risk in, in associating with, with that producer. So again, it's it's one of these it depends kind of questions. There's no clear answers it really depends on 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 the circumstances um so uh, i've i've talked a number of times about uh uh, uh risk assessment in the answers i gave to the uh the questions that have come up in the q a uh, there is in the additional materials we provided uh some information on risk assessment and supplier engagement uh, 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 in, in terms of uh, some of the things that uh, that you want to be uh, uh, looking at, the benefits of a good ESG risk management and supply chains, and then uh, some of the uh, starter points that you might want to look at in terms of uh, wrapping your heads around wrapping your head around uh, the risk assessment to be done on a particular uh, supplier. Um, if you can move on to the next slide. Um, again, in terms of the risk assessment that you want to do on your suppliers, uh, we provide a list of supplier risk red flags, certainly not an exhaustive or limitative list, but some of the key things that you might want to be looking for uh, in terms of red flags from, from your suppliers. Um, next slide. Um, we talked a lot with Andrea as well about uh, contractual mechanisms in uh, to, to uh, pursue or implement your ESG objectives in your supply chains. Um, there's a number of different ways of doing that, and different companies will have different approaches to, to doing that. Um, but uh, 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 if you look at... Uh, uh, at the points we have there, you'll see some examples about uh, uh, the types of things that you may want to bake into your contractual supply agreements. And uh, uh, there is even some public material available on, on a major company called BASF that, uh, that you might find interesting and provide a good example. Andrea talked about the great experience of Enbridge in terms of their supply chain, and I would encourage you to look at the public uh, material, uh, the public source material that, that they have produced, and that's very helpful. Uh, other companies have done similar things, and you have an example there on, on that slide. Um, so if you can move forward to the next slide. Uh, Typical ESG compliance clauses, um, we provide an example there. It's, uh, uh, again, not limitative. These are very sort of, I would call them pared down or modest ESG compliance clauses, but hopefully providing you with, uh, with a reasonable uh, starting point uh, uh, to build out your own ESG clauses if, uh, if you don't have them already. So you want to move forward to the next slide. Um, and then finally, we 
provide links in the presentation to uh, a number of resources for ESG related resources that uh, uh, that we hope you'll find uh, useful as well. And that as you build out uh, your ESG supply chain uh, ecosystem and look at uh, uh, complying with the uh, upcoming legislation in Canada or the legislation that's passed uh, in Canada, uh, 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 we hope that these resources might be might be helpful to you as well. Um, I see that there is another question. Uh, when a, a supplier is a service provider, not a product provider, is there a different process? Well, that's interesting. Do you, Andrea? What's the Enbridge approach on that? Do you do you have a material difference between service providers and and products providers in terms of the uh, the ESG ringer that you put them through? I wouldn't say yeah. The the process is any different, but the risks are clearly different. So, for example, you know we may be looking more at. Um, uh, human trafficking, for example, in a services contract, um, as opposed to, you know, forced labor or, you know, it, it, it just really depends on what the product or service is. So, so, that, so we look at those on a case by case basis, really. Um, I, I would say that our presentation today is focused on goods more than, uh, than services and, and, uh, uh, but the considerations are are similar. Um, you know, you don't you, if if you're procuring for a major project, for example, engineering services, the likelihood or risk that uh, you've got human trafficking or forced labor involved uh, is probably pretty low compared to purchasing uh, a, a product that's that's mined in a high risk uh, jurisdiction. Um, so this, the, the, the risk profile may vary significantly depending on the service that you're, that you're talking about. So uh, I'd say the principles are the same or similar. They're part of your supply chain. They're part of what you bring into the company in order to be able to make what you make for the benefit of your customers. Uh, but the risk analysis is often quite different in the context of service provision as opposed to uh, as opposed to product provision. Now, you also have in your supply chain significant service providers, shipping companies, customs brokers, and so on. And there are certainly some significant ESG considerations in those functions. And for example, customs brokerages and port fees and port services and marine shipping are areas where there have been uh, 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 long-standing uh, 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 issues, particularly of bribery and corruption. Uh, that is well known uh, and, and uh, that continues to be problematic in many jurisdictions. So that is certainly something that's part of your good supply chain that's associated with your good supply chain that companies need to be focused on and, and need to ensure that their agents, intermediaries, shipping companies, and so on are, are living up to the standards that, that you expect of them. So I, I hope that that helps answer that particular question. Um, in regards to sustainability reporting, this one's for you, Andrea. In regards mm -hmm. to sustainability reporting, have Enbridge taken steps to ensure double materiality in its impact assessments? Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna I'd be happy to answer that question offline because I'm unfortunately I'm not the person who pulls together all the sustainability reporting. I contribute to it to the extent that um, that it's relevant to the work that we do, but I would have to speak to someone else in the company that that takes that responsibility to be able to answer that accurately. Okay. Well, look, we're at twelve fifty-eight. We've uh, uh, used up uh, used up our time, I think, quite effectively and efficiently. If there are any uh, last Q and A, you have like thirty seconds to put them into the Q and A, and we'll we'll try to deal with it quickly. Uh, otherwise, uh, listen, Andrea. Again, thank you very much for uh, your your testimonial, um, your uh, sharing of the Enbridge experience. Uh, very interesting, very valuable, and I'm sure that 
you'll get lots of hits on your website as a result yeah. of this presentation today. Yeah. People going to see what your what your materials uh, uh, and resources uh, look like. Uh, I, I, frankly, I want to commend Enbridge for the uh, the seriousness that uh, it, it with which it approaches these issues, and uh, you're uh, you're uh, a great example for for uh, for other companies on this front. Uh, and uh, it was very kind of you to come and and share this experience with us and with the audience. We're very grateful. Uh, thanks as well to Sean for for preparing those remarks on the uh, the new Canadian legislation. And thank you to all the participants, and in particular those who uh, kindly supplied some questions for us to uh, to discuss. Uh, on that note, seeing no further questions in the Q and A, other than a couple of thank yous, uh, I'm going to call this uh, webinar to an end and give people back about 30 or so seconds from the allotted 60 minutes that uh, we had. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Andrea. And thank, thank you, you. everyone on our end who helped organize this. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your days. Bye-bye. <laughs>